Hello and welcome again to Backpage. I'm Jody C. and today we're visiting with Tommy Skeens about his book. It's a memoir called Buff Grunt, Memoirs of a Tree Bat. So Tommy, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad you're here. Tell us, give us some backstory on this book. Um, that's hard for me to do. It's, uh, okay. I'd say about 50% of the book is uh, about my tour in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the rest of the book is uh, what I did with the PTSD that I found there and yeah. carried home with yeah. me. So I, I heard about this book through Christy Athens. You had been in a class, I think, that she taught yes. in Eastern Oregon. And so she posted it on Facebook. And since I, you know, got my ear to the ground, constantly looking for writers that I can give a leg up to, I thought, this sounds intriguing. So um, that's how Tommy wound up from all the way from John Day to this particular um, seat, hot seat right here. But um, you were in the army, was it the army you were in? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and, and you went in to serve your country. I went in to go to war. To go I to wanted war. to go to you war. Wanted, you wanted to get, have that experience of Absolutely, fighting. from a childhood, throwing dirt clots, pretending like they're, they're hand grenades, grenades yeah. digging foxholes in a field across the road. I wanted to go to war my whole life. Mm -hmm. And it was just part of a journey, an experience, I thought. Mm -hmm. And it was. Yeah, kind of disillusioning, though, in the long run, I would think. In my particular situation, yeah, most of it was uh, not what I expected. Uh, mm -hmm. I. I spent 10 months, for the most part, living out of uh, my rucksack. Never, ever got in, a, in what I would call a good firefight, a good exchange of, mm -hmm. you're shooting at me, I'm shooting at you. OK, we're in war now. Yeah. It was more like walk along, get blowed up, kill a bunch of unarmed civilians. I just couldn't understand it, you know? Yeah. So out of that, you became, you got involved in the anti-war movement. When I got home, that was my pledge to my buddies. Yeah. Tell me about that. How did that come about for you? Really good. Um, within within uh, two weeks of showing up on a Southern Oregon campus that I'd never been to before in my whole mm -hmm. life. Down in Ashland. Down in Ashland. Mm -hmm. I showed, it used to be Southern Oregon State College. It's right. Southern Oregon University now. There. But uh, within two weeks, uh, I was distributing uh, anti-war leaflets on campus, mm -hmm. taking classes, and banging the girl in the, in the apartment downstairs. So yeah. everything worked out real well. <laughs> I tell you, this program is nothing if not truthful, right? <laughs> by golly. <laughs> you will read that same passage in yep. the book, by the way. Yeah, I did, I did read that, okay. as a matter of fact. So, but that's the truth, and that's, that's what we want with, yeah. a, with a memoir. And then I became Jody because I found out that her husband was in Vietnam at the time, didn't even know she was mm -hmm. married, but he was doing the exact same job that I'd left the year before, and it just knocked me over and go, whoa. And that was from the song, Jody Got Your Girl and Gone. Like um, that, yeah. The, the mar marching chants that mm -hmm. we would use, you know, uh, uh, ain't no use of going home, Jody's got your girl and gone, and all these other kind of things, just to convince you that uh, uh, you better keep it straight, because uh, it didn't make any difference. Right. Jody already had your girl, right. and your sister, and your mother, <laughs> and your pet, and yeah. your dog. You know. And probably your wallet, too. And probably your wallet, too. So you were in Vietnam for how long? 362 days. Whoa. But who's counting? But know? who's counting? Yeah. So were you, um, I remember you wrote about uh, your clothes just sort of disintegrating from not changing them and from the jungle um, foliage ripping at your clothes all the time. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Why could you? It's really common. There was no way to take a shower anywhere or go jump in the river. Or? Our, we got in country, and about 11 days later, we were climbing it at that time, and we we walked off the hill. Our first patrol was 28 days, mm -hmm. so we lived outside of the wire. We would dig foxholes nightly, and just keep wearing the same clothes. And you know, uh, you got 150 guys. Uh, you don't get too close to people after about a week in the field, because you know, yeah. your odor is like, uh, I think they're over there somewhere, you know, yeah. kind of thing. But uh, our first patrol was uh, uh, 28 days. We came back in, got inside the wire for 10 days, went back out for 30 days. And when we went out for 30 days, we got a new resupply of guys. So we left a hill with 182 guys. Mm -hmm. Full complement for the company came back 32 late, days later with 140 guys. It's just, you know, no firefights, just sniper here and there. 
people getting blown up. Really? Lots of mines. Bouncing wow. Bettys. Yeah. Wrote a poem about so that. So explain what the, a Betty is. It's called a Bouncing Betty. Bouncing Betty is an M1A1 anti-personnel mine um, that is, uh, if you would take a quart can and then put another quart can on the inside of it, so get that smaller quart can about that size, mm -hmm. and then have a little teeny knob on the top with three short pieces of wire about this. You move those wires, that Bouncing Betty jumps out of the ground three to five feet and then explodes and then hundreds of steel balls go out in all directions. It's like, wow. blow your legs off, sucking chest wound. Uh -huh. The first one we hit brought down 10 guys. And then it seemed like the whole year was filled with that. I don't yeah. know. You lose track of things really fast, you I know, in those situations. Because the next step is the only thing you can really manage, you know. Well, you know, th that was something that I wondered, like, um, it, it, you know, if, if mines are planted here and there, and you don't know, and those, what were those things called, those punji sticks, mm -hmm. you know? My, my brother was in the Marine Corps, and they warned him about those things. Mm -hmm. But um, you never really knew. I mean, your next step could be your very last. I, mm -hmm. I just don't know how you could keep going. I would freeze. I don't know at the time. I just wanted to do it, and so I just kept going. But I look back at it now, and I think, I'm not sure, but I think I made a decision. I had a choice. I could crawl in a hole, mm -hmm. stay the last guy in line, go to the safest place I could, or I could just go for it, see what's here. If it's meant to happen, it's meant to happen. And I, I chose to go for it, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, are you still in touch with uh, any of your Army buddies? Very few of them. Yeah. My closest friends, and because of the PTSD and stuff, my closest friends are... Uh, mostly internet people, mm -hmm. uh, Facebook friends that I've never met mm -hmm. personally. My really closest buddy is, was in our unit as a, as a combat medic and then he was Graves Registration. At the same time, he went over on the ship with us and stuff. Never knew him at the time, but he lives in Washington and now we've become very, very good friends. And, and he's a, a wordsmith, a wonderful writer. And mm. So are some of these other people. Mm -hmm. First is 7th Cav, do Mark Levy wonderful writers and, and I love them because of their skills and their ability to string words together and their extensive vocabularies and I'm pretty much convinced that about all I have is a good story and then I need some help mm -hmm. putting the rest of it together. Well you know? so that's why you went to Christy Athens workshop I would imagine. Absolutely a hundred percent looking for all the help I could get yeah. and her exercises I just love she's, mm -hmm. she's really good. We would do a thing called uh, plein air plain air and so we just go outside we didn't care if the wind was blowing in with 20 below zero and things were free you go outside and take 15 20 minutes and write something mm -hmm. you know and of some really interesting stuff comes out of yeah. that and a wonderful exercise now i follow her around when i see one i go i gotta go up there and do that <laughs> <laughs> you know i used to get together with two friends of mine every tuesday morning we went to this coffee shop and somebody brought a little egg timer and we would Wonderful. write for, you know, 10 minutes about asparagus. You know, the, tell me about the first yeah. time you ate asparagus. Yeah. You know, and, and you just keep writing. And it, it was really astonishing what would come out, you know, if you don't stop to think about it, just, you know, just put the pedal it. to the metal yeah. and write. Yes. Um, and what we kept finding over and over that the three of us would wind up writing a story that would break our own hearts. Isn't that something? Can't that? get better than that. Yeah. You know? I mean, it was really amazing. And it that's is. a that's a writing a writer's teaching technique that I didn't really know about. I just mm. thought this is cool, you know. I kinda had the feeling that this time that Christy uh, Athens will be very successful mm -hmm. and that in the process of getting there, she's gonna help a lot of people like yeah. me and yeah. others to kids that she's been in their schools with the uh, writer in residence program, a wonderful program out of Fish Trap. And, mm -hmm. uh, very interesting. Do stuff. you go to Fish Trap? Do you go to the Never been there. Writers Colony there? N never been there and, and uh, I only know Chrissy and the other writers in residence that show up in the area and I check them out. And then I hustle little kids into them, go, can you, why don't you teach these mm -hmm. guys mm -hmm. <laughs> something? And that works out pretty good. Then, then these little girls will start writing poems and stuff, you know. Yeah. 
Hey, uh, if you're just tuning in, I'm Jody C, and this program is, is uh, Backpage, and we're talking with Tommy Skeens today about his memoir. It's called Buff Grunt, and um, you had a fascinating background. There's a picture of you and your kind of military duds on the back. It's in the pick in my pickup right now. <laughs> yeah, looks really strong and determined. So um, PTSD is a big topic right now in the United States because we have a lot of uh, vets coming home who are badly scarred by that. Tell me your experience with it. Are you okay talking about it? Absolutely, 100%. Okay. I've, I've done buku work mm -hmm. uh, in, in the area. I, when I first started uh, uh, attending veterans groups 10 years or so after I came home, mm -hmm. uh, I joined a veterans group in, in Grant County and the boys instantly were telling me PTSD is chronic, uh, it is incurable, right? And um, I just, I didn't buy that for some reason. I go, okay, how do you know? You, have you talked to everybody in the world who's ever had PTSD? How can you possibly know that it's mm -hmm. incurable? Oh, well, went through a process of maybe 10 to 15 years of uh, seeing shrinks on a very regular basis. Sometimes I would drive uh, a 400 mile round trip to Boise uh, once a week, uh, uh, get in trouble with my boss for taking off too much work and stuff, but I was trying to work through these issues and mm -hmm. stuff like this, you know. And he finally told me that PTSD is chronic and incurable unless you do something about it. And that third part was mm -hmm. the piece that I was really looking for, you know, going, okay, there is something. And, yeah. and, and it's not great, but I think at this point, you can learn to manage your PTSD. Mm -hmm. You can recognize it. You can stay away from those situations that make you tight, that start, uh, that, that trigger mm -hmm. you, uh, yeah. trigger responses and stuff. You gotta get rid of the substances. You, you, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you gotta get rid of it because it just complicates the battle so much that you, that you can't possibly address the real issues in PTSD until you get rid of the booze or the drugs or, and the other things in mm -hmm. your life and stuff. Eventually got to a point where I was conducting critical incidents uh, stress debriefings uh, using the Mitchell model for conducting debriefings. And during, and I was working for the Forest Service at the time and I started the team in Eastern Oregon and uh, uh, trained the team members and then would take them out and, and run them through the process. They would go to two debriefings with me as a second chair. I call them, they're the chasers because uh, if somebody jumps up from the debriefing and, and uh, Dee Dee Mouse wants to leave the room, we got a chaser. Dee Dee Mouse. Dee Dee Mouse, run fast, get okay. out of here. You know, that's mm -hmm. what you tell them before you shoot them. The, anyway, um, so uh, we'd have a runner, the chaser would follow them, and they would say one thing, one time, and then shut up. And that's, <coughs> excuse me, that thing was, it's really hard, isn't it? And then shut up, and that person would just dump on us. <laughs> Here it comes and just spill it out. Just wonderful little things. And almost always those people would return to the group instead of continue their journey out mm -hmm. of there and stuff, you know, just neat stuff. So for you, what, mm. do you, if, if you have a trigger for PTSD, do you feel it coming on? And do you know what to do to stop it or to circumvent it or? It's mostly avoidance. Okay. I hardly have any friends. I live alone. If mm -hmm. you drive by my house at night, it'll be dimly lit. There won't be any bright lights anywhere because that silhouettes me inside the house, right? Blinds okay. will be pulled, um, those kind of things. I, I travel alone. I live alone. Uh, my best friend in the county was a medic in the 9th Infantry Division, and He's my best friend, and maybe once every three years we'll go take a hike together in the woods, and mm -hmm. that's about all we ever do together. It's, it's just that way. Loss of communication with the family, with mm -hmm. loved ones, with, with uh, children, with, uh, it, mm -hmm. it pretty much you know, addresses most parts of your life. You yeah. know? Does your, did your the, my teeth is another one. It, yeah. that's, that's one of my little things that I've found out in the last four years. Um, part of the thing about withdrawing for society is that nobody likes to be around people that are ugly or unattractive. So if I, if I have terrible personal hygiene and, and I've learned to, in the course of a little over a month, I can actually push a tooth out with my tongue just by working it and working it and working it. And 
and and I kind of laugh at that because I know exactly what I'm doing. But on the other hand, I'm I'm making myself unattractive for other people, so they just don't want to be around me mm -hmm. as well as I don't want to be around them necessarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing, PTSD. Part of, one of the stories uh, that's in this uh, called. Uh, Combat Jack mm -hmm. that has all of the sexual elements about uh, combat and, and, and some different mm -hmm. things going on in there. Um, I'm That's sorry, for, I was a little bit far. Yeah, for some of these guys, that, that was a, a, a sexually arousing thing, was the whole idea of combat and, uh, and killing and so forth like that. It was a, it was a high. Apparently was a, so. Yeah. Uh, you know, climaxing when you're cutting the fetus out of a, yeah. uh, those just terrible things and you go, never associated those two things before, yeah. you know. Wow. Because it's, I mean, there's some intense stuff in this yeah. book, you know. There's a, a lady who was uh, deployed to, uh, to Iraq. Uh, while she was there, she was uh, raped by uh, her, by the Americans she was serving with. She'd been in and still is in counseling in, in the state of Washington. And my buddy took a copy of a story that was published about a rape story that was published and uh, gave it to his shrink, who happened to be her shrink as well. And mm -hmm. she had come to the conclusion that all men were predators, that they were evil, that they only wanted one thing and they didn't care about anything else. And after that, therapist or that counselor read a portion of, of that rape story that I'd written, uh, she said for the first time in two years, that girl was smiling when she left the office mm. that day. <laughs> that just hit me, going, this is, this yeah. is too cool yeah. you know, for me. You know? Yeah, very powerful. And that's why I exposed myself so much in, in this book was mm. do it, put it out there, yeah. see what happens. Well, yeah. see, that, that brings up a question too that like for someone who uh, suffers from PTSD, has realized that you have to be alone and live alone, travel alone, do all those things that will keep you by yourself, just mm -hmm. to keep you safe. And yet, you came forth with a very revealing book mm -hmm. about your time and about your life. Isn't that curious? Yeah. I'm in the I process of... I think it's brave. I, I think it's almost insane. <laughs> it's, so let's go for a I've got PTSD and I'm trying to withdraw from society. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm defacing myself in a sense, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, with my teeth and things. But I turn around and write a book, which yeah. is like, I want notoriety and fame. Uh, is there a contradiction here? Not really. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is. I'm, I'm sorry, but yes, I don't, and I don't have the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I know what I've done. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm promoting the book. It puts me in a situation where I go and sit myself up where my back's to a wall and people are coming up. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I yeah, don't. But, you know, like a place like this, this is a safe space here. Very much. You right. know, um, and, you know, I just, I just think that sometimes it's important to step out beyond your own boundaries and that's what you've done with this. Maybe, and I'll realize that someday you know? too, probably. Well, but you will because, I mean, you've already done it by writing the book, you know, and exposing all of this to everybody who wants to read about it. That's, a, that's, a, that's an act of yeah. courage yeah. to do that. And so if it, maybe that's the, the beginning, maybe that's the baby step. Maybe by people reading your book and, and, and commenting to you about it that you'll realize that it, having people around is maybe not such a scary thing. You know? Very, very wise of you. And so. that's, that's already happening mm -hmm. uh, to a great degree. It's, it, it's really interesting. You run into people and Two days ago, a guy come and knocked on my house. We haven't spoke to each other in 10 years. Had a falling out because I, I bawled out his sister for flying her flag at night without a dedicated light. <laughs> just, oh. just little things, you know. It's like, he came over to my house, you know, and knocked on the door and stuck his hand out and we talked for an hour. That mended all of those things. Uh, so it's very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, one of the things I noticed in your book is that you were a uh, gung-ho soldier, wanted to go to war, wanted to have that experience of being at war, uh, and yet you had very definite opinions about people who send men like you to war because it seems like most of the people who are all big war advocates have never been in war. And so you talk about that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So tell, expound on that. 
No, I just steal your thought. Right now in Afghan and, and uh, 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 Iraq and Afghanistan, 1% mm -hmm. of the population is holding up all the weights. They're doing multiple deployments, and then they are not being, being taken care of when they come home. The military, since, since 2001, during the Bush administration, they collected research from all over the world uh, dealing with PTSD, and they brought it all together in one place at Harvard University. They gave them a no-bid contract to, to develop a method for treating PTSDs for these, these ongoing wars that we have. They came up with a thing called prolonged exposure. I think it's in the front door, out the back door, war on the cheap kind of a thing. I've, I've had experience with it. I, I went through the process for about three different sessions and stuff. And it is screwed down so tight that uh, you can't do that to a veteran. You screw a veteran down tight and he's going to back up and grab his weapons. You know, you need to loosen up and, and have some room there. And the other thing is they're, they're testing these people while they're still in the military for PTSD. Then they're bringing them right out and right away going into the PTSD. It took me 40 years to figure out what was going on. These guys are going to say the same thing I did. I just want to go on with my life. I want out of the Army. I just want to go to work and just do that right and get out there and start it. Well, and then we do that, and then we run for 10 or 20 years before we start going, you know, I'm really screwed up. I just beat up my wife last night, and I got drunk, you know, and slept with the neighbor's daughter or something, you mm -hmm. know, just... Real serious stuff, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm very concerned about that. The percentage of rapes uh, of the females that are being deployed. I'm fully in favor of, of deploying females in any role they want to take. They want to pick up a, a rifle, hey, go for it, you know, if you mm -hmm. can do it, go for it. The lioness teams, have you heard about them? And, no. Oh, wonderful story. I've got, I've got their tape. Uh, but the lioness team, females going out, getting in firefights with the Taliban, face up to them, you know, killing people. Marvelous stuff in a sense. I hate to say marvelous, but uh, hardly any recognition from those because instantly, I mentioned it to one guy who's very right wing, and he said, uh, oh, they're all lesbians because they're willing to do what, mm -hmm. they volunteered to do this very difficult mission. The Marines, when they first got into, uh, uh, I, forget in, I forget the name of the place, they F could Fallujah. not touch. Fallujah. Fallujah, and they yeah. could not touch the females. The locals would just go insane if they touched the females. So they go, we gotta have females in here because they can at least you know, pull off their helmet and let that long hair, right away they had communication. Mm -hmm. And then those females could search those women with long skirts and see if they were carrying any explosive devices and stuff. Beautiful program. But these women actually got into combat. In some case, in one case, they rescued a uh, squad of Marines, you know. This one girl tells a story about having a saw, a squad automatic weapon, and she's running tail with these Marines. And she says, the Marines don't work like the Army guys. Those Army guys, you know, you know where everybody's at. This guy's here and this guy's here. The Marines are like, ooh, this guy, you know, all over the place like this. And she said they're supposed to tap, tap back when they move forward because they, they come in a stack, right? They have a stack, five people in a row or so, mm -hmm. and you got your hand on the guy in front of you. And so when you move forward, you're supposed to tap back. We're moving, we're moving. Well, oh, they were in the okay. middle of the street. They all moved out, went into a building. She's standing in the middle of the street, and she turns around. And <laughs> she looks up, and her friend, this other female, is on top of a roof of a building. She, oh, hi. Her friend's going like this, hey, hey, hey. And she looks up there, oh, hi, how you doing? And then she realized all these bullets are landed <laughs> all around her, you know. Mm -hmm. So she, she, and, and then she tells a story about the first time that she killed a guy, you know. Mm -hmm. Had him there, knew, knew what was happening, thought about it, and then pulled the trigger. I'd like to give her a kiss, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, if she's watching, she may give you a call. I hope so. Hey, I'm Jody C., and this program is Backpage. If you're just tuning in, we're visiting with Tommy Skeens about his book, his memoir called Buff Grunt, Memoirs of a Tree Vet. And so tree vet means from your time with the Forest Service? Absolutely not. Okay, what does it mean? It's the first paragraph of the last chapter. Okay. <laughs> it will tell you exactly what it is. Okay. But I'll tell you if you really want to know. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Okay. Um, a tree vet. The Vietnam veterans in Washington, D.C. hang out in the tree line on the ridge above the bowl that hosts the wall. Okay. They do what they got to do. Mm -hmm. Booze, smoke, whatever it is they got to do. Mm -hmm. They do it on the hill, and about 3 in the morning they come off the hill. 
and uh, go down to their dead. Mm -hmm. They're called tree vets. Mm. That's yeah. where that comes from. Yeah. And but I don't go to Washington D.C. to do it. I do it a block from my house at the where yeah. they have the ceremony. But it's 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 pretty emotional for you. Very much. Yeah. Getting close to the wall is emotional. As soon as I turned the keys off in my car in Washington D.C. when I went five days before 911 happened, uh, uh, I, all of a sudden I couldn't breathe and going, whoa, this is powerful, and I haven't even seen the thing yet. Mm -hmm. You know, just lots of years to get there. Yeah. And at the time, I'd worked really hard, and I had the names of 12 of my dead there. And uh, since then, I've completed that project, had no idea I'd ever do it, but I've got the whole battalion now. And, and it's also, there's also a link in the book to the website uh, if you're interested in those kind of things, of following an infantry battalion for 46 months in combat, mm -hmm. every single casually producing event and the documents that go with it. And wow. Guys have taken those documents to the VA that they've been fighting with for over 10 years and going, here it is, right here, a document. Pow, they would get their disability rating where before it was, you know. Mm -hmm. One, a friend of mine that was shot in the stomach and, and uh, I went down to my belly in his driver in North Carolina once uh, when we greeted each other. The VA wrote him after, oh, 22 years of paying him a 70% disability they wrote him and told him that he didn't have a Purple Heart, they, no record of a Purple Heart, no record of a CIB, Combat Infantryman's Badge, that, mm -hmm. that little thing there. Mm -hmm. Well, I was standing four feet away from him when he won both of those things in the same second. You know, he got yeah. shot in the stomach and he fell down. Okay, you qualify for those. So I wrote him a non-threatening but very explicit letter. Mm -hmm. uh, and like three months later, he got 100% disability. But they were going to... Yeah. Cut him off. It's yeah. just like, how can you people do this? Mm. Well, I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's it's fine. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad people are are hearing this stuff because it's really good to know. But but we're running out of time, so we're going to have to ride on out of here. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is Buff Grunt by Tommy Skeens. Where can people get this book? Amazon.com. It's also available at the other regular outlets, Barnes and Nobles, and stuff like that. Okay. Very good, and um, I'm Jody C. This is Backpage. Be sure and join us again when we take another peek at the Backpage. And remember, we're all in this together. More of the same than different. Do your best. Thanks, Tom. You're a wonderful lady. Thank you. <laughs>